Greetings and welcome to Biology 1030, Organismal Biology. I am your uh, instructor, Dr. Jibo Zanzo, and uh, let's talk about organismal biology. So, organismal biology is really uh, a way of learning about the biodiversity, uh, which is to say all of the life on Earth. So to start off with, understanding that, we need to understand a few terms, like for example, systematics, which is the study of the diversica diversification of uh, living organisms on Earth and their relationships to other living organisms. What we're really looking at is the biodiversity, which is the number of species, genera, uh, the number of named groups of organisms. Uh, on Earth, and we know that uh, we don't know exactly how many species of life there are on Earth at present, or that there have ever been throughout the history of life on Earth. But we have a good, a relatively good, educated guess that the number is somewhere between that's uh, more than a million and probably fewer than 90 million. And the consensus is that it's probably somewhere in the order on the order of 30 million or so. So um, that's about how many species we'd have to contend with if we were trying to learn each and every one of them, and we won't have the luxury of time to uh, explore all that. Uh, but we will get to learn how we can tell what, uh, where living things fit into the great uh, tree of life. So classification uh, is the assigning of organisms to hierarchical groups. So you've probably heard about species and families and kingdoms and phyla and all those things. Um, and classification is how we know where to put a particular organism into which set of uh, hierarchical groups. And nowadays we try and perform classification based on phylogeny or the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. And we infer phylogeny uh, using a number of different techniques, morphology. Nowadays, most of that the phylogenetic work is done uh, using molecular characteristics like the nucleotide sequences in DNA or the amino acid sequences in proteins are very informative uh, about phylogeny. So taxonomy is the study of the naming of groups of organisms. So we talk about species and genera, and uh, each of these units, these units of taxonomy are called taxa, which is what you have if you have more than one taxon. Uh, because this word comes to us from the Greek, it's plural uh, is not just formed by adding an S instead of having more than one uh, taxon being taxon with an S, we have taxa. Um, we're going to see a lot of that as well. Uh, how we use Greek and Latin word roots, which means that we have to form plurals in new and different ways. So anyway, that's uh, what we're looking at this semester is biodiversity. So you may recall uh, that Charles Darwin in his notebooks drew a diagram that looks something like this. And this was uh, his model for phylogeny or for diversification of uh, evolution of lineages of organisms and uh, several uh, species might have evolved from a single common ancestor which shares a common ancestor with other, another lineage of organisms uh, so the branches lead into branches that come to us from more uh, deep and ancient history all the way back to some uh, very primal form of life that uh, we don't really know what this most primal form of life is. But it does seem that all life shares so many different characteristics uh, that we talked about back in Biology 1020 that there is some uh, ancestor that is common to all organisms. But we know that life is diverse, and Darwin proposed that this tree-like uh, diagram can be used to represent that diversification. So 
we have a cluster of taxa on a branch, uh, and we have some fancy words to describe these branches. We call that a clade. Clade comes to us from the Greek word for branch, uh, and it is a lineage of organisms that is derived from a single common ancestor and contains all of the descendants of that uh, common ancestor. So if we go back to uh, this diagram, where are the clades? So this here, this group labeled B, would be a clade because we've got four uh, species, let's say, that share a single common ancestor. And so if we just trim the, brand, the tree right here, bloop, all four of these species would fall out into a nice, neat, orderly clade. Uh, over here with C, we can see that there are these three species which share a common ancestor. So if we trim the tree right here, bloop, we get these three species falling out nicely. Uh, but then if we have B, C, and D all together, uh, including these what are extinct lineages here, if we cut the tree right here, bloop, that whole thing falls out nicely, and that also forms a clade. So a clade is any branch that includes a single common ancestor, so a single point where we can snip, snip, and all of the uh, branches that are attached to that fall out nicely, okay? So over here with A, we've got a clade here, we've got a clade here, anywhere we can trim the tree and uh, have all of the, the leaves or the, the, the branchlets fall out together makes up a clade. All right, so that's what I mean by a lineage of organisms that is derived from a single common ancestor and contains all descendants. Uh, we can describe lineages using some of these big fancy words. You can see they all contain that uh, suffix phyletic, referring to their evolutionary history. So a monophyletic lineage or a monophyletic clade is a lineage that has a single common ancestor. So everything diversified from a single ancestor. Uh, holophyletic is a word that you're not going to see in your textbook, but holophyletic, uh, we usually use monophyletic and holophyletic synonymously. When we talk about a monophyletic lineage, we usually mean that it includes all the descendants of that single common ancestor. Uh, paraphyletic, uh, para means on the side, and a paraphyletic lineage includes some but not all descendants of a single common ancestor. And I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, polyphyletic refers to a lineage or a trait that's found in uh, a trait that's found in many independent lineages. And I'll give you uh, an example of that. I think right now. Uh, not just yet. A few more terms. Okay, so. For systematic philosophies, um, historically we've used an evolutionary philosophy. Uh, and the rules for uh, the evolutionary philosophy of systematics is that taxa should share recent common ancestry, and we expect that there's going to be some morphological similarity to unite those taxa. And uh, when we do this, we may get some paraphyletic taxa. And again, we're not quite sure what paraphyletic means, but we will see that in a moment. Uh, the cladistic philosophy suggests that all taxa should be clades, meaning that all taxa should be both monophyletic and holophyletic. All right, let's look at a picture that's going to clear this up quite a bit. So here is a dendrogram, or a tree diagram, it's sort of a cleaned up version of what Darwin drew. And on this phylogram, this dendrogram, we've got fish here, uh, and amphibians here, and mammals. Uh, and then we've got these other lineages here, which all represent what we normally think of as reptiles. And then we've got birds, which are aves, over here. Okay, so all of these are vertebrates, uh, everything that's not a fish, from fish on up, are tetrapods, or four-limbed creatures. Everything that's above the amphibian line here is an amniote, including us. So, um, the vertebrates comprise a monophyletic and holophyletic lineage. Okay, so 
All vertebrates uh, share a common ancestor. And if an animal has a backbone, uh, then it's going to be a vertebrate in this lineage. We can put it somewhere on this tree. We're not going to find any vertebrate animals. We're not going to find a vertebrate octopus or a vertebrate uh, jellyfish. Um, we don't expect to find that. So we can say that this is a monophyletic lineage. Okay. So anywhere we can trim the tree and have everything fall out together, we can say that is a monophyletic lineage. Okay, so what's what's the issue here? Well, the issue is that uh, if we look at this this clade up here, so everything above uh, in in these these uh, shapes here, you can see we've got a monophyletic grouping which includes testudines, which is turtles and uh, tortoises and terrapins, uh, lepidosauria, which are uh, snakes and lizards, uh, crocodilia, which includes alligators, caimans, crocodiles, and then aves, which are birds. So you probably walked into this class thinking birds are not reptiles, uh, but they are in a clade with all of these other organisms which are reptiles. So if we want to adopt a cladistic view of what is a reptile, we would have to include birds. In order to have a monophyletic and holophyletic, including all of the members of this clade. Uh, but birds are so very different from all other members of this clade. Uh, they do not have scaly skin except on their feet. Uh, they have feathers, they lay hard-shelled eggs, uh, they have forelimbs adapted for flight or uh, may have lost the ability for flight. Uh, but birds really aren't uh, like reptiles in what we normally think of as reptiles. So uh, if we want to have our traditional reptile group, then we have to uh, call reptiles a paraphyletic group because it includes most but not all of the descendants of that common ancestor. If we want to exclude birds and say that's a different taxon, uh, we're adopting an evolutionary philosophy and not a cladistic one. Okay, uh, and there's also an example of a polyphyly in here, which is represented in this red-orange shape. So this is a characteristic that has uh, evolved in multiple lineages. In this case, uh, mammals and birds share something in common, which is that we're both warm-blooded. We're both uh, homeothermic. We're not poikilothermic or uh, cold-blooded as our turtles and snakes and alligators. Uh, so this is something that evolved in two different lineages. So it evolved many times, so we say it's polyphyletic or it's an example of a polyphyly. Okay? So how do we establish clades? Uh, well we wanted to look at characteristics that might unite certain uh, organisms together. So these characteristics we can describe as being plesiomorphic, which means they're ancestral, uh, which means it's the old way. Uh, apomorphic means it's a derived characteristic. So what is the new state? What made uh, a, a group of organisms different from the common ancestor? Uh, if a characteristic is symplesiomorphic, it is a shared ancestral characteristic. Uh, synapomorphic means a shared derived characteristic. And this one, synapomorphies are the most uh, important in terms of uh, how we define clades. Where are the boundaries of clades? Where do we see diversification occurring? Uh, these are the most informative, are the synapomorphies. Uh, syn and sim are really uh, the same prefix, just uh, if it's before a vowel, we can use sin. 
And if it's before a um, consonant, we use sim, because simapomorphic sounds weird, and simplesiomorphic doesn't sound too weird. But anyway, these are the rules of uh, Greek grammar, and we're just going to have to follow them. Uh, so autapomorphic, this last one here, is an unshared derived characteristic. It's all by itself. So if we look at 